Good evening, everyone. Let's have a Bible class. What do you say? Turn to Ephesians 4, and you can get Titus chapter 2. And if you want to be ahead of the game, you can also get Romans chapter 12. Ephesians 4, Titus 2, and Romans 12. What a combination, right? Well, it's a pretty good one, as a matter of fact. Um, wanted to just mention to you that um, if you happen to be watching this for the first time or you haven't watched a lot of our classes, uh, what we're doing here now is talking about walking worthy of the vocation wherewith the Lord has called us. So this starts basically with an understanding about the whole armor of God, which came about because we talked about this spiritual wickedness in high places, which came about because we were talking about Satan, Lucifer. And so you go back about, um, I'm not sure how many weeks, probably uh, seven or eight, go back about the end of July and then start looking at the messages. They'd all have some sort of a follow-up ring to them. So uh, no matter where you pick up, what we're really just talking about is what God said to us in Romans through Philemon. You know, if we study according to the instructions in 2 Timothy 2.15, we'll study by rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing does not throw away any of the word of truth. Neither does it throw away any, any scripture anywhere. But it does make us see a perspective of the scripture that says, this was written for these people when they were here. This is written for these people when they were here. This is written for people who are yet to come. And then this, Romans through Philemon, is written for us, which are referred to in the Bible about 16 times as the church, which is the body of Christ. Now, there's no reason to wonder about the body of Christ uh, in the sense of it being a separate entity. But if you do wonder about it, well, you just hunt the Bible over and see if you can find any reference to it or the things that pertain to it other than the Lord Jesus Christ, his blood was shed for our sins, his burial, his resurrection, and the atoning power and, and perfect sacrifice that he was. You can find that throughout the Bible. But the things that pertain to, number one, our salvation, number two, our standing with the Lord, number three, our walk with the Lord, number four, our promise from the Lord is all found in Romans through Philemon. So we study these books to make sure we know what's written to us. We study the other books to see what's set in contrast, or if we're talking about a subject that is universal, then we'd be talking about in other books, what is in agreement with Romans to Philemon. But when there's a disagreement or an apparent disagreement in scripture, then you must look at as it says it, where it says it, to whom it says it. In other words, paying close attention to why God would write such a thing and for whom he wrote it. Now, with all that in mind, let me remind you that we're talking about walking worthy of the vocation wherewith the Lord has called us, as we find here in Ephesians chapter 4. Notice in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. And then here's an instruction that most of us really don't even like, <laughs> but it's there anyway. It says, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Now, uh, lowliness has, has to do with not necessarily putting yourself first or trying to be the big eye. And meekness has everything to do with allowing the authority to be the word of God and not taking unto yourself this authoritative picture. Then there is long suffering mentioned there. Long suffering is, is like patience. It's like putting up with something you don't like. And then forbearing one another in love is to see your own brethren in the light of the love that God shared with them. In other words, for God so loved the world to you and I is written like Ephesians chapter 2, look back there, one page backwards, verse 4. Ephesians 2, 4 says, But God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. Well, since God loved us with his great love, 
verse 5 then goes on to say, even when we were dead in, uh, in sins, God hath quickened us together with Christ. Well, Christ was quickened when he was resurrected from the dead. So if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, you were quickened with Christ back then. So therefore, any sin, any sin that you might ever commit, past, present, and future, was all taken care of, or God Almighty could not have quickened you with Christ. And so we see our position then is that we belong to the Lord. When you hear the truth that Christ died for your sins and you believe that God raised him from the dead for your justification, then there, there's a trust factor. You put your faith and trust in what Jesus did instead of what you're doing, and he seals you under the day of redemption. And when the Lord, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ's activity seals you under the day of redemption, how long do you suppose you're going to be sealed? Under the day of redemption. So, that being said, we're talking about what saved people face. People who have trusted Christ, people who are picturing themselves in the, in the scripture that says to walk worthy, as in chapter 4. Now, I want you to read with me two couple more verses in Ephesians 4, and then I want us to look at some things in Titus. So, we'll look in Ephesians chapter 4. He says, of the gifts given unto men. The gifts given unto men are people. Gifts given in, unto men are not things. In verse um, 8, it, it says that he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men, and he describes these gifts in verse 11. And he gave, and he gave some apostles. The time frame of, from the apostle Paul until the last apostle died, whoever that was and whenever that was, brought about the writing of the Word of God. And he gave those people, those men, those apostles, and some prophets. And all of the time, before all of the Word of God was written, there were prophets. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, 37, which is about 20 some odd years after, uh, he wrote this after he had been preaching for about 20 years. He said, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write are the commandments of the Lord. So a man who would follow Paul uh, in the sense of the uh, ex uh, accession of, of, of uh, God's word, he couldn't change what Paul said. He must acknowledge that Paul wrote the commandments of the Lord. So there, here in Ephesians chapter 4 then, these gifts in verse 11, here's what they're for, verse 12. Oh, I'm sorry, there are also evangelists, pastors, and teachers, which we have today, because an evangelist takes a word and he just broadcasts it. A pastor and a teacher would do what we're doing here. He would care for the people that were listening to him or a part of what his assembly was, and he would care for them in such a manner as the Word of God would fit into their lives, and then he would teach, as a teacher would. He would teach what he could see in Scripture. And now it says, here's what that's for, verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So now if we know, of, if we know Christ as being completely full, he is, the Bible says he is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Well, here it says, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. In other words, all of the body of Christ, everyone that's saved by the gospel of Christ is in the body of Christ, and all of the body of Christ is going to be a perfect man for all time and eternity. When the Bible says that when we go to be with the Lord, it's ever to be with the Lord, it's because we're his body. The embodiment of everything that Christ is, is what saves people from our time frame, our dispensation, are going to amount to in the future. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we appear with him in glory. Now, keeping those six or seven, whatever it was, verses there in Ephesians 4 in mind, 
we want to be able to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit, but we're looking for the day when we can all come together in the unity of the faith. The unity of the faith will be a day of perfection. Now, now I want you to go over to Titus chapter 2, and I want to, this is kind of a shift. It's a, we're talking about the same thing, but it's kind of a shift of what I'm making the emphasis on. Titus is written to the young man Titus, and Paul wrote this because both Timothy and Titus were receiving the word um, without Paul, without benefit of Paul being there. In other words, Paul had been their, their tutor, their master, their teacher. And um, he gave them all his word. All the word of the Lord came, that came to Paul, he wrote down. And he said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, just a page or so backwards, he said that he had finished his course. He said he'd kept the faith, he'd finished his course, and he was going to die. And so he's preparing both Titus and Timothy, but I want to concentrate on Titus here because in, in Titus 2 and 3, it's about teaching. Now, many of you, some of you uh, who are live here tonight, some of you who will watch this on YouTube, many of you can and will and desire to teach. And when you do, I've only got three words for you. <laughs> Get on with it. That's four. Four words. Get on with it. What you waiting on? Now, I realize you have to feel like you're ready. If you ob obtain to that, uh, please tell me how you did that. But I, I, I know, I understand. What, I'm, I'm just kind of pulling your leg about that. I understand what that's like. Uh, I got saved when I was 22, and, and that was in 1964. It was um, January of 74, which is 11 years and three months before I heard about rightly dividing. And it was about six or seven months later, probably August of that year, before I really admitted out loud that I believed I should preach and teach. But during that eight and a half years or so that I was in the organized religion up in Illinois, uh, I did teach. Well, that's probably not true. I was a Sunday school teacher, but to say that I taught, that probably would have been a pretty, pretty big stretch. I was there, I had the teacher's manual in front of me, but I don't think I ever taught anything worthwhile. First of all, I knew nothing at all whatsoever about rightly dividing the word of truth. I never had studied the scripture. I would pick up the quarterly on the way out of the, of the house on Sunday morning, and that's about the extent of my study of it. And so it wasn't much of a teaching. It was more of a discussion group, and usually somebody else was a stronger discusser than I was. But when I saw what rightly dividing the word of truth would sort of unfold about the Scripture along the lines of Genesis to Malachi and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and the book of Acts and Romans to Philemon being separate, uh, separated from Hebrews to Revelation, when I began to see all of that, I began to see that there were things I should teach. And it was bothersome. It really was. So it took a while to settle it down inside, deep down inside of me, as the Lord said to the apostles, so that I could feel like I should teach. Well, Titus got a lot of these instructions. And so I'm going to talk to you about some things here in Titus tonight. And I know that you know that Titus wouldn't have his name atop a book in the Bible if the Apostle Paul did not know his testimony. And likewise, you should know mine. I was raised by a separate Baptist preacher. My father was a separate Baptist preacher from about two years before I was born until basically he retired, stopped preaching altogether about age 83, I believe. Now, <clears throat> I went to church from the time I was two weeks old. Of course, not, not too, didn't have very good memory back then. But I was from about two weeks old up until I was about 14 and a half, almost 15 years old. And when I got that age, I just quit going, and they didn't bother me about it, so I just quit. 
Uh, Barb and I got married at age 17, and she insisted on going to church, so we went to church with my mother and father, or we went to their church. And we continued to do that for um, uh, the better part of four years. Um, I never believed I was saved and um, never acted like I was saved. There was some discussion one time about Sunday school class for boys at that separate Baptist church, and my dad asked me if I wanted to teach it. I thought that rather odd since he knew I was lost. Sound odd to you? But I did it, and I taught for a, a few weeks, and what I knew more than anything else, that I wasn't able to teach them anything. So I quit. I got transferred to Danville, Illinois, and immediately promised what I thought was the most hypocritical thing a guy could do, allowing people to believe he was a Christian when he wasn't. And so I got so under conviction about that that on a Thursday night, last, part, last Thursday night of October 1964, I gave up on all that I thought I was and I allowed the Lord to save me. The words that I used, which are not part of my salvation, but the words that I used were, Lord, I'm a mess, please save me. And I knew who the Lord was. I was raised with the Lord in mind. I knew who Jesus Christ was. I had sang all of the songs that had a better picture of the gospel than most separate Baptist preachers ever gave you. And I knew them all by heart. But I still was not saved because I never had trusted Christ as my Savior. But that Thursday night in October, I just let the Lord save me. And uh, perfect peace. As a matter of fact, after I said those words, knowing that I was giving up, couldn't do a thing, there was this peace come over me, and the very next thought in my mind was, is that, all, is that all there is to this? Well, religion took over. First thing I did was go join a Baptist church. Took my wife and two little boys and walked down the aisle and joined a Baptist church. Nobody at that church asked me if I was saved. Nobody. Not the pastor, not the deacons, nobody. Because my daddy, after all, was a Baptist preacher. I must have been a Christian, right? Nobody asked me if I was saved. Several months later, the preacher and I were on our way to a golf course, if I recall properly. And I said, Cliff, you remember the day we joined the church? And he said, sure. And I said, well, you know, I'd just gotten saved on Thursday night before that. He said, really? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, that's just wonderful. I said, I just wondered, should I get baptized again now that I'm saved? And he said, oh, no, it's not necessary. Never thought any more about that until about 10 years later when I was learning about rightly dividing and seeing that there is no water baptism for the church, the body of Christ. By one spirit, we're all baptized into the body. It has nothing to do with water. And when I thought about what his answer was, I thought, well, yeah, he knew better than that. He knew there wasn't anything to water baptism, and he didn't want to be embarrassed. He took somebody into the church without even knowing he just got saved. So, starting in 1974, I quit. I chunked the religion. The organized church could not offer me anything. And I started studying by rightly dividing the word of truth. The Bible, as it says it, where it says it, to whom it says it. Now, having said all of that, I feel like Titus is written to me because I'm preach and teach. Some of you may have that picture in your mind when you read Titus. Now, I want you to look at some things that are direct from Paul to Titus in the sense of, here's what you do, okay? And I want you to start in, in Titus chapter 2, verse 1. He says, but speak thou. He's already talked about all the bad guys in chapter 1. He says, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Let me tell you what sound doctrine is. 
<clears throat> sound doctrine is doctrine that cannot be washed away. Doctrine that is going to stand the winds of change. Doctrine that is going to put up with the fiery darts of the wicked. No flood, no tornado, no hurricane, no fire is going to do away with the doctrines that are sound. So he says, speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. In other words, the word comes out of a teacher's mouth, and if it's right according to the scripture, it will be sound doctrine. A, the word doctrine means teachings. So it's soundly taught to the individual so that the individual knows you don't change that. You stand on that. It's like it starts with the gospel, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, was buried, was raised for our uh, justification. The Bible says, according to the scriptures, raised the third day, according to the scriptures. It's for our justification that he was raised. And it's so that we can understand that we will be raised again. Now, that's the most sound doctrine you'll ever hear. The gospel and the tag along, the thing that you do when you hear the gospel, and everyone that you teach the gospel to when they hear it. The tag along is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Believe that he died for your sins. Believe he was buried. Believe he was raised for your justification. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's called preaching the gospel. That took about 80, 70, 80, 90 seconds. That's all. Sound doctrine. Notice now, here's why handle yourself according to things which are sound doctrine. Verse 2, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as become of holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Yes, that scripture did say all those things to young women and about young women. Verse 4 and 5 needs to be reiterated a time or two, don't you think? People say, well, I don't think it's that way today. Why isn't it that way today? Did the Word of God change? No. I understand things that are different today, and I don't think they're necessarily become contrary to the Word of God. As a matter of fact, notice that thing about keepers at home. You know how a woman who works for a living should keep the home? Come on, man, listen to me. She's the boss of the home. She's not the boss of you. That's her house. And she should delegate the authority out to children and even to you. She, you should do things in the home that the way she wants them to do it. You know why? God Almighty put her in charge of it. If I were you, I wouldn't get too much in her way. Now, she goes fiddling around in your tool shed. You may have something to say about that, but listen to me. Even if a man stays home and his wife goes out and makes the better living, the home is still hers to keep. That's what it said. Keepers at home. And then it goes on to say, good, and it says obedient to their own husbands. Women, I don't give a flip how much money you make, and I don't care how much you rule that house. Listen carefully when your husband speaks to you. You know, I'm in so many people's trouble right now. <laughs> Listen, folks, this is the truth. This has not got anything to do with whether you like it or don't like it. It's the truth. And everything that's there will fit your household, even if the husband stays home, the wife goes out to work, even if there are no children. Even if everything is shared equally in the home. You know, I just never did like somebody telling me they believed in 50-50 marriages. You know why? I ain't never been one. 
There's never been one that worked the way the Lord wanted it to work if it was 50-50. I'm sorry, but the man has got the final word. And you know why he doesn't have? Is when he doesn't want it. You got to let that one sink in. Men who do not have the final word don't want it. If they wanted it, they'd get it. They'd take it. Men make the same kind of discretionary moves as do women. And there are times when a man says, this is an area I'm not going to take the lead in. You're going to do that. And that area may be to such an extent that he says, bye-bye. But he still does not take the lead if he doesn't want it. And he does take the lead in the, in the marriage and in the home if he does want it. I've seen gazillions done a lot of biblical counseling, listen to a lot of people tell me their tales of woe. Folks, that's the way it is. Now, to the young women, though, he's teaching them to be discreet, which means not be a, uh, wagging the tongues and tattletailing all over town. Chaste, which means that they take care of themselves and they are for their husband. And it says that the word of God be not blasphemed. Now, that's a big issue. You see, if, me, if young women obey verse um, uh, 4 and 5, they will be taught by the aged women how to keep from blaspheming the word of God. Now, to blaspheme the word of God is not the same thing as blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, and it's not about an un, uh, unforgivable sin or any such thing as that. Blasphemy against the word of God is to disagree with what the Bible said. Oh, yes, it is. Blasphemy is to stand against or speak against. And if you disagree, <laughs> if you disagree with verse 4 and 5 in the principle of it, if you disagree with that, that is blasphemy of the Word of God. By the way, I'm not trying to put you on a guilt trip, but I'm trying to get you to understand whether you're right or wrong where the Word of God is concerned. And by the way, I'm not really talking to young women here. I'm talking to men, men who want to teach aged women so that the aged women can teach younger women. And by the way, the perfect manner in which that occurs is mother to daughters to daughters to daughters to daughters. We don't live in a really perfect world today, do we? Not so much. All right, verse 6. Young men, watch. Young men, likewise, exhort to be sober-minded. Young men should be taught by the preacher, the teacher, to be sober-minded. It isn't a matter of whether or not you ever think anything's funny or you have a good time. That's not it. To be sober-minded is to know how to tell the difference between seriousness and frivolity. Sober. Young men, likewise, exhort to be sober-minded. Now watch. To the teacher, in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. What should the teacher, Bible teacher or preacher do? Show himself a pattern of good works. Now watch. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness. Gravity. Now gravity is a lot like that sober-mindedness. Gravity means bringing it back down to the earth where it belongs. Follow gravity. Where's it? Where does gravity stop when you hit the earth or the ground? Gravity, sincerity. There again, it isn't anything to do with whether you ever, ever have a good time. It has everything to do with whether or not the sincerity reaches through the teaching and so that the Word of God is of great effect instead of none effect. Then verse 8, sound speech that cannot be condemned that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed. If he is contrary, what's he contrary to? He's contrary to sound speech, and he's speaking things which are condemnable. Sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part 
may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. The teacher should do the things of verse uh, 7 and 8 so that people don't go away from there and knock him down and mock him and put him to shame before the brethren. Now, it is true that some men take that way too seriously. They really do. And I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry that some people take it too seriously. I've had young preachers tell me they couldn't continue preaching because something went wrong inside their family. And when I got to, exam, you know, trying to like cross-examine them about it to see what it was that went wrong, it might be something that a, an adult child in their family did. Let me tell you something, parents. After your teenager is about 14 or 15, you have very little influence. If you know a 17 or an 18 or a 19 year old that still primarily listens to his father and mother, praise the Lord for them. There aren't very many of those around. Now, when they get to be 21 or 22, it is amazing how smart their parents have gotten in those few short years, and they go back to them for advice and thank God for that. But men who take themselves too seriously can get caught in the trap of self-condemnation because their children are disobedient. When the Bible talks about having disobedient children, it's talking about this size or this size, maybe 12 or 13. You get up into teenage years in the world we live in, from electronics to automobiles to um, uh, every other form of entertainment that's going on in the world, it has reached down and grabbed the young teenagers. So you influence them by the word of God until you cannot train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, not getting old, when he is old, he'll not depart from it. They will remember their roots. You give them the word of God, they really will. Now, in the context, when, when people, when preachers in, in particular take themselves too seriously, they're headed for a fall. Go back to 1 Timothy and look in 1 Timothy chapter uh, 3. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, let's read these uh, instructions for what a bishop must be. This is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the snare of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. I, I, I misread verse 6, says, into the condemnation of the devil. Verse 7, in the snare of the devil. Now, you see, in those seven verses there, what you've got is a pretty tough order. Pretty tough. It's about a bishop. It's not about a pastor or a teacher. <laughs> It's about a bishop. Now, someone who just starts teaching, preaching, full of zeal, he's also full of errors. He'll make some. You should limit the errors that you make by every means possible, but you should know you'll make them. And you see, the point is, he's not a bishop. A man can go out and pastor a church, go out and start a Bible class, let the Bible class grow, and they begin to put in, 
uh, have a building or a, a sign out front or something that indicates they call themselves a church, which is fine, that's not a bishop. That's a pastor and a teacher. Pastors are all teachers. That's a pastor and a teacher. And that's not a novice. That's true. You don't want a novice. The, the, the mistake power gets too high when you have a novice. But the ruling here is about a bishop. Notice Titus chapter 1. Look in Titus chapter 1. Verse 5. To Titus, Paul says, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldst set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. Now please notice. He said, ordain elders in every city. Elders. Elders are not novices. Elders have been around a while. And he, I don't think it was particularly about age that he referred to them as elder, but that's what the word means, older. But it could be older in the Lord. It could be the experience, the, the, uh, like the greater or grander or, or longer experience of it. But notice the ruling and how close it is, and notice how he changes what he calls them. Verse 6, if any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, watch, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to, fil given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught. Now, that's a bishop. Young men going out to teach and preach, get on with it, and don't worry about whether or not you are a bishop. You ain't. You could be a pastor, and you are a teacher of the word of God, and you teach the things that you know. Not long ago, a young man told me he was going to preach for the first time, and I said, whatever you do, preach what you know. And I hear that he did. It sounded pretty good to me when I heard the recording, and other people told me he did great. Well, that's what you have to remember, young men. Teach what you know. Don't teach things you don't know. I can tell you some things that will happen to you if you teach things you don't really know. Now, Back in chapter 2 of Titus, I want to complete my thought here and move on to something else. <clears throat> he told Titus about speaking the things which become sound doctrine for aged men, aged women, young women, and young men. Now notice, he says in verse 9, exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining but showing all good fidelity. Now, before we go to that last phrase, on these people that he's telling the, uh, the he's telling Titus to teach, servants, they're saved servants. He never told anybody to teach lost people anything except the gospel of Christ. So he's telling them to teach saved people not to purloin. You know what purloining is? It's stealing. You think that's something? That's nothing. Hold on to Titus chapter 2 and go back to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4. In Ephesians 4, it is in here, I promise. Man. In Ephesians 4, look what Paul tells saved people. Verse 25, wherefore putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. He had to tell saved people to quit lying. Then he says in verse uh, 26, be angry and sin not. In other words, if you get angry and it's a sinful thing that, that, uh, that you have this anger, then you're going to continue that anger into a revengeful attitude or some such thing as that. He has to tell them not to do that. Verse 27, neither give place to the devil, which means he has to tell them not to let the devil control their time. Verse 28, let him that stole steal no more. He's telling saved people, don't steal. 
but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. That would be like <laughs> bad words coming out of your mouth. And yes, it would include filthy talking, but it's more along the lines of that which would corrupt the individual who's hearing you speak that way. Who's hearing those wrong words. Corrupt communication is wrong words. And then he goes on to say, uh, verse 30, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. Now watch. Talk about a personal attitude. Look at this. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Malice is like plans. I'm going to get that guy. That kind of thing. Verse 32. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. We love to see that last phrase uh, expounded upon, but we ought to look at the others. We should forgive one another. I hope nobody here is listening to me here or that ever listens to this on the broadcast ever has a grudge they're holding. Don't do that. Forgive people. I know it's difficult. It doesn't have anything to do with whether or not it's difficult or easy. It doesn't say, now, if it's easy enough, forgive one another. It says, forgive one another. And if I could just tell you everything, I could tell you lots of stuff about that. I promise not to. Go back to Titus and look in Titus 2 again. Titus 2. The last part of verse 10 says, <clears throat> uh, to them all, if you will, speak sound doctrine to the aged men, the young men, the young women, the aged women, the, uh, I'm sorry, the aged men, aged women, uh, um, young women and young men and servants. And he says that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. And the appearing uh, to all men has everything to do with all men without distinction. You don't get everybody saved. It hasn't appeared to them in the sense of salvation, but it has appeared unto them in the sense of how you're saying it to them. The grace of God that brings salvation. We know from Romans 1.16 that the, the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation. We know from... Uh, uh, Ephesians 1, verse 13 and 14, that it's trusting what that power of God is worth is uh, uh, brings salvation. And here he says it's the grace of God. As in, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So here it says, the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men. And then he says, that teaches us something. Look at that very next verse, verse 12. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Wow. That's a tall order, Paul. Teaching us. The grace of God that brings salvation has taught us. The adornment of the doctrine of God our Savior in all things has taught us that we should live soberly, righteously and godly in this present world. Well, how in the world do we do that? We deny the ungodliness that comes our way. We deny the worldly lust. We put away the worldly lust. People say, well, what's that? Well, I don't know how to tell you this, but the worldly lust and the ungodliness that Paul taught Titus and Timothy to avoid is religion. I know you're supposed to keep your flesh under and keep it under in subjection and all of the things that go along with that. That kind of goes without saying in the sense of uh, Bible dis uh, teaching Bible discussion. You're supposed to put away ungodliness, deny the ungodliness of worldly lust. Don't teach it. You know, one day, sitting in a Sunday school class in a Southern Baptist church after we moved to Alabama, the Sunday school teacher comes in and begins to tell what a great thing had happened that week, but he wouldn't tell us what it was. 
Well, that's all right. If it was all right. But he wanted us to rejoice with him without us knowing what it was. Well, you know, I said, I'm glad, happy for you. <laughs> but wait a minute. I wouldn't know what that was. And he wasn't going to tell me. I, I, it wasn't that I wanted him to tell me. I didn't want him to ask me to rejoice in the Lord with him. I didn't know if it was of the Lord. And that's okay. But he shouldn't have asked. He should have just said, I am rejoicing in the Lord. And we'd have all said amen. And as it, when it started, that's what we did. And he wanted us to be just rejoicing in the Lord with him, even though we didn't know what it was. And I don't know if it's a personal problem. I don't know if it's a personal sin he had got rid of. I don't know. I don't even care what it was. He shouldn't have asked us to rejoice with him in something that we didn't know what it was. Why? Because that puts us in a different category. We're, we could be rejoicing of something that was ungodly or was a, the fulfillment or the fruition of a worldly lust. How would we know? He was a preacher, licensed, I think even maybe ordained, but he wasn't pastoring a church. I just thought that was a strange thing to do. He couldn't tell us what this great blessing was, which is fine, but he wanted us to be a part of it. I didn't feel like I was a part of it. I never did that. Every man praises God of himself. We'll get back to that in just a moment. But now in this passage, when he says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, he's not telling Titus to get out of this present world. He's telling Titus to live on in this present world. And the people that Titus teaches are to live on in this present world. You and I are still in this present world. He has not taken the saved people who get saved today. If they're still here, if we are still here tomorrow, they're in this present world. Oh, yeah, I know we are new creatures in Christ and praise God for it. But we still got this present world's needs. We have this present world's plans. We have this present world's professions. And we have this present world's um, um, uh, need for provision. In other words, nobody can live free. You know, people say, well, I just, don't, I just don't care anything about money. Oh, yes, you do. Say, well, but love of money is the root of all evil. Well, you don't have to love it to use it. And you don't know anybody, including preachers, that don't need it. Everybody's got to have it. You know, uh, Brother Sam Gerhardt asked me to come up there in a couple of weeks to about three weeks to take his place on Sunday morning. So I asked him where he's going. He's going several states over, I think it's Missouri. I'm not sure exactly where it is. Illinois, somewhere in Illinois. He's going over to somewhere in Illinois for a Bible conference. Wow. Well, you think that's going to, he's just going to get in his car and drive over there without buying any gas or any food or anything like that? Will Sam need money to go from Eastern Tennessee all the way into the central Illinois, or actually it's up around Peoria, I think, northern Illinois. Will Sam do all of that without having any money? No, it'll take money. So it's the, what Paul is not trying to get people to throw all of that kind of thing into uh, this, pres uh, this uh, worldly lust issue. No, that's this present world. And it wasn't the same in Paul's day, I'll grant you that, because the Romans ruled it differently. But it rules us today. You can call it filthy lucre if you want to, but it ain't filthy if you get it honestly. It's just lucre. And it's to be spent and used. It's a medium of exchange. And you don't know a single solitary preacher who can get along without it. Not a young man, not a man teaches one Bible class a week, one teaches eight a week. Doesn't make any difference. It takes money to operate. And it's a fascinating thing what people think preachers ought to do about that. And I'm not going to dwell on that, but I am going to tell you this. The Bible says they that preach the gospel should live with the gospel. So, well, I know most preachers work for a living. Any preacher works for a living. <laughs> Let me tell you something. 
The Lord's always caused people to be um, a provider for Barb and I. But you don't know what hard work is? Drive 1,200 miles a week and teach six Bible classes in, in uh, seven days and see how well that suits you. Work-wise. I'm not talking about trying to gain any glory here. I'm just talking about work-wise. People think preachers don't work. I've had people say, well, what do you do all day, Jerry? What do you mean all day? What do you do all day? Well, I'm a this or I'm a, I'm a pipe fitter. I'm a welder. I'm a preacher. It's work. Study is work. Preparation, thought patterns, work. Driving in your car, going someplace to teach, that's work. Listening to people's questions and having good uh, godly conversation with them, that's work. So well, that's just fellowship. Of course it's fellowship, but it's work. Stand around after a Bible class. The hostess serves cake and coffee or soft drink or something, and it all looks like it's just fun, fun, fun. But the preacher's still working. And then when he leaves there, he drives home. And it don't leave his head. He's still working. I've never left a place, got in the car, and fell asleep. Never. Uh, an hour and a half down the road, if I'm still not home, I might get sleepy, but no, no, no. All I'm trying to get you to see, folks, is that this is what this world is. We can't change the world we're in. We can hardly find people willing to believe the truth of God, God's precious gospel and the, the truth about rightly dividing. How in the world would we change this world? We can't change this world, and this world demands things of us. And I've had people say to me, the preachers get by all kinds of tax breaks. They don't get any. Preachers don't get tax breaks. Preachers pay taxes like everybody else does. In fact, most of us Pay both sides of the Social Security like an like a independent businessman does. And frankly, it's the best way to do it. But nevertheless, people have strange thoughts about it. They find out that a church doesn't pay taxes on their income, but that's not the, the church's income is not the preacher's income unless he takes the money. And when he takes it, he pays taxes on it. I'm sorry. That's not all I wanted to say here. But I want you to understand something about what worldly loss is versus the, the end of that verse is uh, following after um, uh, soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. This is a horrible world to do that in, but it's, it's called, you're called upon to do it. If you're going to teach the Word of God or preach the Word of God, that's what you're called upon to do. And we haven't even gotten started with that. I want you to go back to Romans chapter 12. And I don't know if I said, I may have said, no, I said 12 while ago, Romans 12. In Romans 12, verse 1, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren. Now, this would be anybody, even though what I've been talking about so far back in Titus, and mostly that in Ephesians 4, is about teachers and preachers. Notice this is everybody in general, the brethren. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to, unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world. There comes that old world again. See, he said, no, don't follow after worldly lusts. Well, you, if you conform yourself to this world, how are you going to get away from the worldly lusts? Well, you're not. And once again, that is religion. It's not what you have to have to get along in this world. You know, a man, Brother Moore, we used to try, drive a long, long ways, and he would stay overnight. And he discovered that he could buy uh, sleeping vans of various uh, comforts, and uh, it was better for him and Bernice. Now, that would not be better for me, but it, it was for him and Bernice. 
They could stay in their own van. He said, my home just goes with me, is what his terminology was. And so he was showing some guys one night the van that he had just bought. And a guy said, well, uh, do you think this will last you a long time? He said, well, no, custom vans are not going to last a long time when you drive them as many miles as I do. He said, frankly, what I'd like to have is a maxi van. And some of you may remember what that was. And there was a man standing there. And he said, huh, the day you buy a maxi van be the last day you get any money from me. But more reached in his pocket, went through the checks he had, handed the man back his check, and he said, I might buy one next week. Well, I hope that slapped that guy in the face. Number one, if he's given money to a preacher or a teacher for the expressed word of God coming into him and his wife and family, what the heck does he care what the guy does with the money? He's giving that as unto the Lord, is he not? Why would he care about it? It's only money. And he's going to probably, that guy especially, I know him, he was probably going to get a tax deduction from that. You know, the government allows some of that. All I'm saying to you is, what in the world is he talking about? Why is he so angry? Brother Moore shouldn't buy a maxi van. I don't know if that old guy stood around long enough to see what Brother Moore finally drove in the terms of uh, motorhomes. He, 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 the maxi van's out the window before Brother Moore got done buying motorhomes. There's nothing wrong with what a preacher buys with his money. I mean, if he's going to go out and uh, drink it up and, you know, wine, women, and song thing, that might be uh, something you'd want to watch out for. But come on, what do you care what he spends his money for? You give it to him as unto the Lord. If a man spends the time and takes the time and effort to go teach you the word of God, Galatians chapter 6 says, let him that is taught communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. What difference does it make to you what the preacher does with it? Anyway, present your body a living sacrifice. It's just reasonable. Now look at verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Aha! that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, with those thoughts in mind, we're going to have one more thought here, and then I'll quit. Look over in chapter 14. In chapter 14, he says in verse 16, Let not then your good be evil spoken of, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat, he says, destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or is, weak, is made weak. Now watch, hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Now, I know there's some stuff there about meat and drink and whatever, and that wasn't my point. But my point is, listen, folks, we all stand before the judgment seat of Christ ourselves. That's what uh, verse... Um, um, 10 and 12 said, verse 10 says, But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Well, then, if we have to give an account of ourselves unto God, then what possible difference could it make in our lives? What possible difference could it make what other people do? And so we judge that which comes before us. Now, in my thought, my thought process here, my mind goes back to where we started. Are we going to listen to pastors and teachers? Yes, we are. Are we going to build them up or tear them down by our words? Are we going to take the things they say from the Word of God and claim them and stand by them and help those men to do their job that's what we should be doing. And are we going to appear 
with the grace of God ever present in our minds, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Those are the keys. That is the answer. I thank you for being here tonight. We'll uh, stop the recording and uh, turn the uh, mics back on.